Welcome everybody to the 2016 Football Clinic Training. Really excited that you're here with us today. And uh, we're going to spend some time talking about what's going to be happen happening at the Football Clinic this year. Before we get started, let me just go ahead and open us up in a word prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I got to thank you, God, for what's going to happen on the field at the Football Clinic on June 7th. Heavenly Father, I pray that this would be an environment this year that the name of Jesus is lifted high in that place. On that field at Oliver Citywide Academy, that people would come to the field that day to meet the Steelers, and that they would come that, that day to play football, but they would ha actually have an encounter with you, Lord Jesus. And so, God, we pray that, that you would do things far exceeding, exceedingly and abundantly beyond what we could think or imagine possible. And, Lord, we just trust you with all the results. We pray for great weather that day. We pray that there would be sunshine, Lord. We pray that we'd be able to stay outdoors. Uh, God, we just pray that there would be a great turnout of the Steeler players, of the college players, the high school players, and that, Lord, kids and families from the community would just swarm that field that day. And uh, at the end of the day, Lord, they would walk away knowing that they had an encounter with Jesus. So we pray this thing in Jesus' name. Well, we're talking today about the football clinic at Urban Impact, but before we talk about the football clinic specifically, we just want to make sure that you understand how the football clinic feeds into the vision and the mission of Urban Impact. And so I just want to share with you and just, and just remind you of the vision of Urban Impact. Our vision is that we desire to see lives holistically transformed in our community, one person, one family, and one block at a time, who in turn make a powerful impact both locally and globally for Jesus Christ. So just to break this down a little bit, when we talk about holistic transformation, what we're talking about is transformation of both the mind, the body, the soul, and the spirit. That when we want to impact kids and families, we're seeking to impact kids with the good news of Jesus Christ, but we're seeking to impact them in a holistic manner, mentally, emotionally, socially, physically, and spiritually. And so when we have kids come to that field that day, we want to be thinking about them as a whole person. We want to be thinking about the whole family. We want to think about how can we bring the whole gospel to the whole person in the context of the whole community. Our strategy is one person, one family, and one block at a time. And many of you may have already heard the story about when Ed walked out of his house and his car had been stolen for the third time. But as he walked out and his car was taken for the third time, he started to ask the Lord a question. Lord, am I wasting my time here? Am I wasting my life? Is what I'm doing here on the north side, is it really making any kind of difference? And the Lord brought a thought to his, his head that day, brought a thought into his mind, and, and he thought to himself, well, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. And then the thought came, well, how can we see lasting transformation in this community? One person, one family, one block at a time. That if we could transform a person, and that person could transform their family, and that family could trans transform a neighborhood, then we could see lasting transformation take place in our community. So that's our, that's our strategy, one person, one family, one block at a time. And we, we want to make a powerful impact, and the place and the location where we're seeking to make the biggest impact is right here on the north side of Pittsburgh. And that goes into our mission. Our mission is to do our part in fulfilling the great commission of Jesus here on the north side of Pittsburgh by following his model of holistic ministry, by investing in the lives of at-risk children, youth, and their families in order to develop responsible followers of Jesus Christ. So when we talk about our mission, what we're talking about when we say the Great Commission is this, that we're seeking to make disciples. We're seeking to make disciples of all nations, as it's commanded in Matthew 28. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I will go with you always, even to the very end of the age. So that's what we're seeking to do here on the north side of Pittsburgh. We're seeking to make disciples who make disciples. We want to raise up disciple makers here in this community. Our target community is the north side of Pittsburgh. So we've been promoting this football clinic out to all the north side schools, all the north side neighborhoods into the north side businesses because we're seeking to raise up the community of the north side to, to, to have an understanding of who Jesus is, how much he loves them, and how he wants to impact and transform their life. And so when we talk about making an impact, we're, we're really trying to make our greatest impact on the north side of Pittsburgh, but believing that there's going to be ripple effects all over the world. And so it's like this. If you had a rock and you were going to throw a rock into a pond, 
where that rock hits the water, is gonna, it's going to make the greatest impact. Okay, but then when the rock hits the water, there's also going to be ripples that go all the way out to the shore. And so that's the, that's the way we see the north side. We believe that as we take the gospel and we communicate and demonstrate the truth and love of Jesus, we earn the right to be heard, we seek to be a, a good neighbor to our, our north side friends and family, and bring the love of Jesus into the north side, that there are going to be ripple effects that happen all over the world. And people are going to be sent out from this place into different states, into different countries, and the, the good news of Jesus will be spread all over the world. So we do this by following Jesus' model of holistic ministry, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. But our, our, our strategy is also to reach at-risk children, youth, and their families. And back when we started Urban Impact, there was a lot of debate and conversation about should we just really target high-risk youth? You know, there's great need in high-risk communities full of poverty and all kinds of things, uh, crime and, and things going on in those communities. Should we just target high-risk youth? And what we decided as an organization is no, we want to we wanna target at-risk youth children and their families because we believe anybody who does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior is at risk. And any one of us could be at risk at any given time. We could be at physical risk, we could be at emotional risk, we could be at spiritual risk, uh, but especially anybody who doesn't have that relationship with Jesus Christ is at risk of spending eternity without their Father. And so we want to make sure that we make the, the gospel accessible to anybody and everybody in our community who's in need of the Savior. And so our end result is this. We want to raise up responsible followers of Jesus Christ. Some of them will stay here in the north side of Pittsburgh. Some will go to other countries. But as they go, we want them to be fully equipped and trained disciple makers. That they understand how to win somebody to Christ. How to build them up in the faith. How to equip them for ministry. And how to send other people out around the world. So that goes back to following our Jesus model of holistic ministry. And what we when we talk about Jesus' whole model of holistic ministry, what we're talking about is something that we've referred to as the cake. So if you've ever seen the cake, uh, this, is, this is kind of a practical implementation of our strategy here at Urban Impact. That when we talk about winning somebody to Christ, what we're talking about is going out and, and seeking and saving that which was lost, just as Jesus did. And so at the base of the cake, we want to win as many people to Christ as possible. And so this football clinic event is an outreach event. Okay, this is certainly an event where we want to reach as many people as we possible, reach our hands as wide as we can, and capture as many people as we can into that environment so that they can have an understanding of how much Jesus loves them, that, about the truth of Jesus and how it can transform their life. And so when we talk about winning people to Christ, we want to think wide, we want to think big, we want to think as many people as possible, and we want to seek to reach the, the least, the last, and the lost. After somebody comes to Christ and they really have that transformation that begins in the heart, we don't want to just leave people where they are because that's not how Jesus operated. He said to his boys, okay, now come follow me. Come and see what my life is all about. Come and be a part of, of this kingdom movement. And, uh, and so what we believe happens and takes place after somebody commits their life to Jesus is that they begin the journey of really being grown up in the faith. And that's where we talk about building in the people. So after we win people to Christ, we want to build them up in the faith. After a certain point of time, if you just continue to build into people, but you don't ever call them to action, it can be like the Dead Sea effect, where everything goes in and nothing goes out, and so it becomes stagnant and it dies. It could be like spiritual obesity, where everything is in, and they never exercise the faith, they never put their, their faith into practice, and so they become slothful and lazy and and just feel, you know, always seeking the next high. And so what we want to do is move people into equipping. Where we're really training them and equipping them to reach the lost people that they once were. And that's what each of us are called to do. We're not just called to come to Christ and follow Him so that we can go to heaven and leave everybody else behind uh, to suffer for all eternity. But we're called to, to respond to God's love. And to, and to really understand how much Jesus loves us, to be transformed from the inside out, and then to let that be like a contagious wildfire that goes out from us to reach lost people, people who are dead in their sin. And we can say, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who comes to me will live even though he dies. And so that's what we want to do. We want to equip people so that we can then multiply ourselves and reproduce ourselves. So we seek to multiply ourselves into the children, youth, and the families, into the volunteers that come, that we raise up disciple makers who
who could be sent out to win more people to Christ. We're also a, a student and youth ministry, and so when you, when you work with youth primarily, you are a ministry that builds to release. And so somebody may not even get all the way up through the, the spiritual process of win, build, equip, multiply, send as they leave Urban Impact, but certainly no matter what, we also want to be preparing and equipping our kids for life. And so we have a program called our Options Program. And so when, when we say we're building to release, the question is to release to what? And so we always talk about having our kids get on five different buses when they leave the north side. And kids are accustomed to getting on buses around here and catching buses here and there. So we talk about getting on these five different buses, which are our five options of college, trade school, jobs, the military, or ministry. And we're seeking to get kids headed in, or seated on a bus, headed in the right direction so that they can be successful in life no matter where they go. So that's a little bit about the strategy of how we seek to, uh, to raise up mature, responsible followers of Jesus Christ. Now, where does the football clinic fit in? When we talk about win, there's a methodology behind winning somebody to Christ. And, and we break it down with an acronym called CPR. Okay? If you think in terms of resuscitating somebody spiritually, you're trying to bring them back to life, think about spiritual CPR. The C stands for cultivate. We want to cultivate that now we're kind of mixing metaphors, right? We're going from CPR to now talking about farming a little bit, right? But uh, we're going to go to, to C stands for cultivate. That if you're going out to plant a garden, okay, and you're going out to, you want to have some good tomatoes or some cucumbers or you want to have whatever is your, your, your choice of, of jalapeno, jalapeno peppers or whatever you like in your garden. And, uh, and before you ever plant that seed though and expect it to grow, one of the first things you got to do is what? You got to cultivate the soil. You got to you got to dig out the roots. You got to get out the rock the rocks. You got to rototill that dirt up, and get it nice and fertile, and, and get some topsoil in there and get some fertilizer. And you have to you have to prepare the ground to be able to receive that seed. Okay, so that's the first strategy as we talk about trying to win somebody to Christ. You got to cultivate that soil spiritually. You got to begin to build a relationship with that person. You have to seek to earn the right to be heard with that person. You have to show them how much you care and, and, and wrap your arms around them and come alongside them in their area of need so that they, they even care enough to know what you think about life and eternity. And, uh, and they have to see Jesus in you before they're willing to respond to the Spirit of God. And so that's what, that's what the first step is in terms of really winning somebody to Christ. The next step is to plant. Okay? There comes a time after you've cultivated the soil, after you've earned the right to be heard, as you've built a relationship, now it's time to plant the seed of the gospel. You begin to share truth from the Word of God. You begin to demonstrate it with your lifestyle and by doing acts of kindness. You, you do things to make sure that when, when they ask questions, you have a reason for the hope that you have in Jesus. And you're pointing them now to Christ. Like, this is why I'm showing you how much I love you because Christ first loved me. And I'm just pouring that out into you. So there's times then, appropriate times to plant seeds of the gospel. Next, what happens after you till up soil, you plant a seed. That seed begins to get watered and grow and, and sun comes and shines down on it. Then what happens is there's an opportunity to reap fruit. When we talk about resuscitating somebody spiritually, this is the time when somebody's ready to make that commitment to Jesus Christ. There has been a cultivation that's taken place. There has been seeds that have been planted and they've been watered and they're, they're beginning to, to prepare to grow and, and now there's a time to reap the harvest. And so this, this is the opportunity where you call for a response from somebody to take action to surrender their life to Jesus Christ. So this is kind of the process as we look at winning somebody to Christ that, that begins to take place. And you can think about this even in terms of your workplace, wherever you're at, whenever you're at other urban impact programs and you're serving in gymnasiums or in the choir or in education programs. How do I use spiritual CPR to cultivate, to plant, and to reap? Well, the football clinic, what kind of event do you think this is? That's right, it is a cultivating event. The football clinic is designed to be an event that cultivates the soil. Okay, we're, we're seeking to show the love of Jesus Christ. Kids love to play football. So we're trying to meet them 
there. Kids love the Pittsburgh Steelers. So we're trying to bring in some of their heroes so that they get to meet some of their heroes. And so we're, we're providing this, this environment of love. We're creating a loving atmosphere. And we're, we're saying, hey, we love you. Jesus loves you. We're going to show you how much Christ loves you. And uh, some of you who are accustomed to being at Urban Impact, you might come to this event and think, man, there wasn't like that you know, 20 to 30 minute like hitting at home gospel message with a call to response for kids come, to come forward and, and commit their life to Christ that I'm accustomed to. And, uh, and, it's, and it's by design because this is a cultivating event. What we're seeking to do is this is an introduction to a lot of kids to Urban Impact. Okay, this is an introduction for a lot of kids to Jesus Christ, and we're seeking to just to just cultivate the, the soil out there. We're also trying to cultivate relationships between our the kids and the families in our communities and other community groups. So we're, we're working with the Pittsburgh Public Schools. We have a lot of other community organizations involved in this event. We have the Pittsburgh Steelers, the some college uh, some colleges and universities that are connected to it. And so we're trying to help cultivate all of those relationships so that people can, can build into each other, so people can sign up for each other's programs, and we're facilitating all of that to take place. We're being a good neighbor to our, our friends here in the north side of Pittsburgh. And so as we do that, though, what I'm asking you to do is to pray for this. What we've, what we've decided to do as an organization is to give the Pittsburgh Steelers, because they've already, in a sense, earn the right to be heard in terms of these kids look up to the Pittsburgh Steelers, they want to be like them, they want to emulate them in so many ways, and so what we're praying for is for God to raise up those Steelers, those players who have a passion for the gospel, who have been transformed by the love of Jesus Christ. And I'm asking you to pray with me. Pray that, that at least one Steeler would get up and share boldly that he loves Jesus, and that's the reason he plays football. And give the kids an opportunity to understand that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He came and He lived the perfect life. That He died a horrible death to pay for your sin and my sin. And that He rose again from the dead. And that by trusting in the name of Jesus, that they would confess with their mouth Jesus is Lord. And believe in their heart that God raised them from the dead. That they will be saved. And if you'll pray with me, I'm believing God's going to do that this year. And so we're believing that the Pittsburgh Steelers are going to be able to come in, share their testimony give these kids an opportunity to have that the soil of their heart cultivated towards the gospel. And so that's that's what we're really trying to accomplish with the football clinic. And, uh, and so when you join us that day, come prepared. Because every single action that you take, every single interaction that you have with those students, every single smile that you give, handshake that you give, hug that you give, is a way to demonstrate the love of Jesus. And to really begin to cultivate these students and these families' hearts towards the gospel, towards Jesus Christ. So, Andrew Churchill is a man who's really been behind the scenes organizing a lot of the details of this event. And he's going to provide leadership on the field as well that day. And so I'm going to have Andrew come up now and, con and continue our training, finish out our training, talking about what you need to know in terms of the football clinic that day. So if you would, please give Andrew a hand with me. Thank you, Seth, and thank you so much for everyone that's here and those who are viewing this on the video. And uh, thank you just for your willingness to come to serve Jesus Christ, to serve the Northside community on June 7th at the Urban Impact Football Clinic. So uh, what you're going to see next is just a basic outline of the schedule for the day. And again, you'll see some times, you'll see some stuff going on, and then I will get into that in more details. But again, uh, you have volunteer registration opening up at 5 o'clock. Youth registration is listed at 5.30. Uh, immediately, I'll tell you that there has been years that if the registration, if the volunteers are ready to register kids and the kids are waiting to get in and the games area that that's set up, then sometimes youth registration may begin before 5.30. That just helps the flow of people. It prevents sort of people from sort of getting backlogged waiting at the gates. 6.15. This will happen. The games and the community tables are going to close. And at this point, we're going to start to move everyone, the parents, the kids of all ages, we're going to move them up to the bleachers. And uh, at 6.30, our program with the Steelers players will begin. We'll begin with the national anthem. 
And uh, you know, there will be a student that is active in Urban Impact's performing arts program who will be singing this national anthem. So you know, please give them your attention. You know, cheer very loudly for them when they're finished because this is one of our kids who's using their talent and their ability to glorify God. So at 7 o'clock, the kids will assemble into their groups. They will enter the field. And at this point, they'll start to move between the different stations on the field. And our, again, go into that in more detail. And also the games area, which will include the bounce house and the inflatables, the climbing wall, along with the community tables. Those will all open back up at 7 o'clock. So the field portion of the clinic will wrap up at 8 o'clock. And at this point, all of the groups on the field, which I will explain, they're going to move back to their corrals, which are also explained. The Pittsburgh Steelers players, they'll depart the field. And uh, at that point, the kids will be free to they'll meet back up with their parents. Now, for an additional 30 minutes, the food will be open, the games area will be open, the climbing wall will be open. And then at 8.30, that will be the official sort of end of the clinic and uh, we'll begin cleaning up. So if we advance the slides and moving on, just uh, to walk you guys through the day, just important information that you'll need to know as a clinic volunteer. Uh, if we focus just on parking, you know, where are you gonna park? Huge question. So basically, I'd ask you, just out of respect for the families coming, that uh, I think we've all been in a situation where we're going someplace, but uh, crowds and not being able to find a parking spot, that could easily scare someone away and just say, oh, forget about it. I can't find a place to park. So uh, we're expecting upwards of two, 300. You know, praise God if we get 400 kids in addition to families at this clinic. So please leave the closest parking spots available for participating families and also for representatives of the different community organizations who will be setting up at our uh, community group tables. So some of these closest lots, there's an Oliver School lot at Oliver Citywide Academy that has access from Island Avenue. It's the closest parking lot to the stadium and football field. Uh, please leave that available. Do not park there. And also there are parallel spots all, all along Island Avenue, which is the road that runs parallel to the football field. You know, again, I would ask you to try to leave that for participants, for the community groups. So. Uh, one additional lot that is off limits is the Brighton Road, Oliver Citywide Academy lot, which is accessed right off of Brighton Road, and it's sort of across the street from the cemetery. And if you've ever done basketball with Urban Impact, this is the gym parking lot for the school. That is also going to be off limits because the Pittsburgh Steelers players, they're going to be parking their cars there. So where can you park? Well, uh, we'd encourage you to park on the roads in the neighborhood sort of beyond Island Avenue. So if you turn the left on Island off of Brighton Road coming up from the city, there's a series of roads that sort of run back parallel to Island or sort of go off from Island back into the neighborhood. So please park on those side streets. There is also a fairly large parking lot that at that time of day in the evening will be unused. And it's across the street from the Clean Care Factory. And that's a pretty big lot that you're welcome to use as well on the evening of the clinic. And that, again, is access from Island Avenue. You'll turn the first left-hand turn onto Winifred Street and then go about two quick blocks and the lot will be on your left. So that's also a parking lot that you can park in on the evening of the clinic. But again, if we can sort of be cognizant to leave the closest spots to the stadium available to the families, then that would just be a great way to just encourage them, you know, the best we can to come on out and, you know, we don't want a, a lack of parking to be a discouragement. And again, you know, you'll probably start to see that cars will be parked on Brighton Road in all likelihood, and uh, that is fair game as well as you're heading up the hill. All right, so that's just parking. So once we're arrived, volunteer arrival. So the first place that you will head as a football clinic volunteer is you're going to head to the volunteer tent. And uh, that tent will have a sign. Crystal White from our staff will be manning that volunteer tent. And uh, it will likely be between the tennis courts and the school. So the school will be very noticeable heading toward the stadium. There will be tennis courts. There you'll see the inflatable set up, the bounce house, and the tent should be somewhere in between the two. So head to that volunteer tent, and at the tent, you are going to each sign a volunteer waiver, and you'll also receive the proper t-shirt for the day. Now, this t-shirt 
will be returned at the conclusion of the evening. So uh, this is not a t-shirt that you can take with you, but it is a way to identify that yes, you are a volunteer. And uh, as will be the case, if you're on the field, this will also identify that yes, you have all of your proper state required background check clearances. And again, if there are, if you do have outstanding clearances, as you're watching this video, I will likely be calling or emailing you or hounding you in one way or the other in order to get you ran because that is absolutely a piece that we are required by law to have in place for you as a volunteer to have direct contact with children. And if there were to be a situation that you are unable to get those clearances completed, and we'll try our very best to coordinate that with you, you can still volunteer in a role that is not involving the direct contact with children. And that would include registration and may include also some specific roles with food. All right, so continuing on this slide, registration volunteers, please plan to arrive by 4.30. Again, registration, there has been some years that we'd like to start before 5.30, so this will just give you some time to uh, get trained, which won't take long. You will be looking for Sarah Van Kirk on the evening of the clinic. And again, registration will be one of the first things that you see. You'll see the tents, it will be labeled clearly, registration. So head off there after you go again to the volunteer tent. Field and game volunteers, plan to arrive before 5.15. Again, ideally, be arriving around 5 o'clock, but again, you'll also report first to the volunteer tent. And then at 5.30, there will be a meeting on the field, right midfield, 50-yard line for all of the field volunteers. So this includes volunteers who are considered group volunteers and also volunteers who are considered station volunteers. So 5.30 meeting, please be there. This will give you some last instructions so that we can just really ensure that uh, this clinic is done with excellence in every aspect. All right, so moving on, group volunteers, just some brief, just a description of what is the role of a group volunteer. Well, as a group volunteer, and we have you divided into group leaders, so there's eight of you who are group leaders, and then the remaining of you, I'm considering you a group assistant. So you are responsible for the supervision of the groups of kids, there's eight different groups, as they move from station to station on the field. And again, I said there are eight total groups, and there are four groups that are on what we call our rookie side of the field, and this is gonna be kindergartners through about second or third graders, and then we have four groups that will be rotating around our volunteer side of the field, and this is gonna be our third through our eighth graders. And again, students that are younger than kindergarten or older than eighth grade, they are free to go to the games area, they're free to go to the climbing wall, they're free to sample all the food, but they will not be on the field going through the stations with the steward players. That's kindergarten through eighth grade. All right, so as a group volunteer, be relational with the kids. Again, build relationships with, the, with them during that hour. You know, keep them engaged while they're waiting because there will be elements as they go from station to station. They're going to be standing in lines. And I just encourage you to keep them active. If you have younger kids, maybe try to play some games with them. You know, really the more kids that we can get engaged while they're waiting in these lines, the less likely we have kids who get bored. When kids get bored, they can run away. When kids get bored, they can start punching their neighbor. When kids get bored, especially at a younger age, they can start, you know, spitting on people or doing a whole range of things that, you know, at Urban Impact, we would say is not a loving atmosphere. So again, the more you keep them engaged, the more you're relational with them, the more you're the one entertaining and amusing them, then uh, the more that they're being a great participant of the football clinic and we don't have any potential challenges or problems. So finally, as a group volunteer, enforce a loving atmosphere. And for some of you who are new to Urban Impact, this is central to how we do each one of our programs and ministries, that the kids know that when they come to Urban Impact, we're gonna create what type of atmosphere? A loving atmosphere. And we do that for respecting ourselves, because each one of us is made in God's image. So we're not junk, our lives matter. God has created us for a plan and purpose. Number two, we're gonna respect one another. You see, the Bible is very clear that we treat others the way that we would wanna be treated. You know, the reality is many of our kids are coming out of a culture, out of a worldview here in the inner city that, you know, respect is something that's conditional. It's not unconditional. That if they respect me, then I'm going to, if they disrespect me, I'm going to disrespect them even more. But what we're saying is that, you know, no, 
Our model for respect is Jesus Christ. So even if your neighbor, even if your friend is disrespecting you, maybe they're dogging you, maybe they're not treating you poorly, that doesn't give us the right to disrespect them. We're going to treat them res with respect because our example is Jesus. The third part of creating a loving atmosphere is that we're going to respect the facility and the property. So again, as these kids move from station to station on the field, we're not going to be leaving trash everywhere. You know, we're not going to be pulling up the grass or anything. We're not going to be wasting the water, having a water fight. We're going to respect the facility, respect the property. And finally, when we create a loving atmosphere, we're going to respect the authority. Because that's, that's a real issue that, especially with the young men, they really struggle with respecting male authority. A lot of times they have not come under the authority of an older man who truly loves them, who has their best interests. They're very skeptical of that. So when we create a loving atmosphere, we respect the authority. Even if we don't agree with them, we're going to respect it. So again, you know, just that's a snapshot of when you're on the field with the kid, enforce that loving atmosphere. You know, hey, you know, that's not how we talk to our neighbor. You know, we have to treat him with respect or, hey, you know, we're not going to be wasteful of the water because there's other kids, they're thirsty too, they need to drink that. Or, oh, you know, the station leader said we have to form four lines, so in order to respect the authority, we need to get in one of the four lines. We can't just be running around. So in all those ways, you know, as a group leader, as a group assistant, you're helping to enforce the loving atmosphere with the kids in your group. All right, so moving on, the next role on the field is that of a station volunteer. And uh, as a station volunteer, you will be responsible for the proper execution of a station. So again, the layout of the field on both the rookie side of the field and the veteran side, there will be four different stations. And the groups, the four groups, they will rotate from the first station to the second, the third, and then the fourth. Each rotation will be 13 minutes. So as a station volunteer, either a station leader or a station assistant, you are sort of at that station and you are really the authority at that station. You're the one who's welcoming in each of those four groups to your station. So when they arrive, you're gonna be giving them immediate instructions. So you're gonna be giving those instructions to the group leaders, to the kids in the group. Again, you know, where they should line up, how many lines do you want, you know, where does the line start? That's gonna be instruction that you, as a station leader or a station volunteer, you're gonna be facilitating that. And additionally, you know, once that group arrives, once they're in position, you're going to work with the steelers to demonstrate to that group, here's how we're going to do the drill. And again, you know, sometimes the steelers, they may modify the drill a little bit, and we'll give them the liberty to do that. But ultimately, as the station volunteer, you're responsible that that drill is getting done, that the kids are having fun, and that, uh, you know, everyone knows what's going on at your station. And you're going to have four different groups coming to you. All right, so that's the station volunteer. That's sort of the overview of both the group and the station roles on the field. And now continuing on, this is a map of the basic overview of the field. And again, you know, for those who are watching this on video, I'm not sure how close you can see, but basically what you'll see is that the bleachers are at the bottom. And then as you move across the track, what the first thing that you're going to see is there's going to be corrals along the track between the bleachers and the football field. And basically the corrals function so that right after the program, the kids are gonna be called down from the bleachers and they're gonna assemble in their eight different groups in the corral that corresponds with their group. So there's gonna be eight different corrals for the groups and again, for a group leader or a group assistant, you're gonna be assigned to one of those eight groups. So you're gonna go and you're gonna meet your kids at their corral, and they will each have a wristband that corresponds with the color of their group. So again, you're going to be directing them to the proper corral, that's where you're going to meet up with them, and then the MC of the event will call each of the groups onto the field. And then as you move up to the field, you'll see that it's divided, the 50 yard line divides the field so that the side of the field that is closest to the school is for the rookies, and that's again kindergarten through second or third grade. And then you have the veterans, third through eighth grade, they're gonna be at the side of the field, you know, what I would call the left side of the field that is furthest from the school. And uh, you'll also see that throughout the field, you know, on each side, you will be rotating counterclockwise, and the 50-yard line will be divided. So you never wanna be moving a group across the 50-yard line. You're gonna be staying on your side of the field. And then moving your groups counterclockwise between the four stations. 
Alrighty, so that's just a brief overview of the field, and uh, you'll be able to see that much more clear on the day of the event. So now we're going to move into just some important things to remember, first for the group volunteers, and then for the station volunteers. So for the group volunteers, the MC will be managing the program and also managing the whole evening. Uh, Nathan Glover is going to be our MC, so you'll be able to meet him on the evening of the clinic. But at 6.52, yes, 6.52, he will make an announcement, and this is right after the program, calling all of the group volunteers onto the field. So at this point, you will enter the field through the security gate, which will be located on the track, sort of closest to the school side of the track. You will enter there and you will move to your corral, you know, so that you're now in position to welcome in the kids who have the wristband that corresponds with your group to their proper corral. So again, I would ask you that during the program, please stay as close as possible to that gate so that you can move pretty quickly onto the field, onto the track. And uh, yeah, you don't want to be way back in the bleachers really far so that it might take you a long time to get there. Second thing, you know, when you enter the field, do again, go to your assigned corral, and then very soon the kids will start pouring into the corrals and you'll be able to direct them to their correct corral. So as you move between the four stations during the clinic, there, each station will be 13 minutes, and then there will be two minutes between station to rotate. And you will hear music, and the music will be your key to rotate your group counterclockwise to their next station. Now, in past years, you know, we like to move it, move it. Makes perfect logical sense. That's been the song that they've used, and that's sort of that two minutes. You move your group to the next station. Maybe they'll get a new song this year, I don't know. But just know when you hear the music, you move your group. All right, a few things during the clinic. If you have a student that says, I really need to go to the bathroom, and it will happen, then one of the group leaders or group assistants, you will take that student to the main field gate, which is, again, sort of located at the far corner of the field, closest to the school, sort of at the end of the track. You're going to escort them to a few bathroom runners that are going to be UIS staff and volunteers who specifically will run that student then to the bathroom. So again, you'll take them to them, they'll run them to the bathroom, and then they'll bring them back onto the field afterwards. And then again, if you were to have a student that falls down or would require some sort of first aid, just complaining of some sort of ailment or headache, there will be a first aid tent that will be staffed, and it will be on the 50-yard line, but sort of on the bleacher side of the field. So it will be off the field, but on the 50-yard line. Go there, and that's the first aid tent if any of your child, children in your group were to require any assistance. Okay, very important. Once a student chooses to leave the field, they cannot re-enter the field. So again, if you have a kid that is very distracted or sees all of his cousins or his mom or his aunt or his grandma over in the games area and just wants to join them, Please, you know, that kid has that option, he can leave the field, but you're going to escort him off the field to the entrance, and then, and then at that point, you know, his wristband will be cut off, and that child cannot re-enter the field. Now, bathroom is different if they're going to the bathroom with a bathroom runner, but if they want to go to a different sort of area of the event, they cannot then re-enter the field. And then, final two points, if you were to have a major disciplinary issue, please call over a field supervisor. The field supervisors are all Urban Impact staff members. They will be having a black t-shirt that on the back says staff in gold. And again, if a major discipline issue were to arise, you know, then please immediately contact the staff that will be walking and be present on the field. Now again, a minor issue, you know, I want to empower you as group volunteers, especially those who have volunteered in Urban Impact programs to please, you know, again, address the smaller disciplinary issues, a disrespectful kid, maybe someone bumps into another kid and that kid, you know, sort of gets a little heated. Address those issues appropriately. You know, if you want to use something like in our basketball or baseball programs of, you know, a warning or a strike system, you can do that. Then, you know, sitting them out at a station and they amass two or three strikes. Feel free to do that. But again, minor issues, deal with that. But if something were major to arise or anything that would just make you uncomfortable, you know, please, by all means, grab that field supervisor and then we'll help you address that and you know, be able to guide you through that process. We did have a year, probably maybe four years ago, that the kindergarten group was just a train wreck. 
and it just seemed like every other minute there was you know 10 kids on the ground wrestling or fighting and we had to call in reinforcements for that kindergarten group but again you know something like that happens please get the field supervisor something minor please as group volunteers you know deal with that internally and finally at the end of the clinic you know the MC will direct all of the groups with your kids to go back to your assigned corral and once all of the groups are back at their assigned corral, then you know we will allow the parents to come and meet their kids at the corral and then escort them off the field. So those are just some important things to remember for group volunteers. So continuing on, some important things to remember for our station volunteers. All right, so you guys will be called onto the field by the event MC, being Nathan Glover, at 6.50 p.m. Now this will be the same time that the Steelers are also going to be called to start to head toward their stations. So again, be close to that gate that's closest to the field at the end of the track. So at 6.50, as a station volunteer, you can head toward your assigned station. And uh, just some tips, once the clinic begins on the field, please keep the lines moving at your station. So you're going to sort of work with the group volunteers so that the lines are moving, the kids are staying engaged. You never really want to log jam at your station. You want to keep it moving, keep the kids occupied, you know. Again, you know, if the lines are so long that it's just like the kids are getting bored, then if you have the leadership to do it, if you have the steers, if you have the football players, if you have the volunteers to maybe open up an additional line, that's a good idea because now more kids are being engaged, more kids are being active. There's just less time for them to stand around, get bored, and get distracted. All right, maintain and require a loving atmosphere at your station. Again, set that standard, just like how we're calling on the group volunteers to maintain a loving atmosphere. You know, again, you know, make sure that the kids are respecting one another, that they're respecting themselves, that they're respecting the authority and the property. So, you know, tag team that along with the uh, volunteers at the group so that that is being maintained. You know, we want to create a loving atmosphere. Some of these kids will not be familiar with a loving atmosphere and that's going to be very foreign to them. But for this hour, you know, that's what we are going to promote and we're going to maintain it. Again, just like a group volunteer, call over a field supervisor if a major dis disciplinary issue were to arise. And uh, the field supervisors will be myself, Andrew Churchill, Matt Davis, who is also on our athletic staff along with Zeus Orihel, and uh, Shaq Hager. So there's going to be four of us. We'll likely be split two on each of the sides of the field, veterans and rookies. So grab one of us. We'll be in the black Urban Impact t-shirts with uh, the yellow staff on the back if there were to be a major issue word or rise, or if you have any questions at all as far as running your station. And uh, just like the group volunteers, we'll have a station leader and we'll have a station assistance as well. All right, so that's just some important things to remember. So just two more slides here. The next slide is volunteer etiquette. And for all volunteers, you know, at the clinic, on the field and off the field, you know, we ask that uh, no pictures. You know, we want to sort of model that to the participants. So we're not going to be taking pictures as volunteers. And also, please, no autographs. It may be tempting for some of you. I mean, but again, no autographs. You know, we, we don't want, once, one person does that, then you could have 40 kids trying to do that, and well, why can they do that, not me? So this is an event where just we ask for no autographs. At the end of the evening, the kids will receive a poster from the Steelers, but uh, you know, it just, there were years way in the past that we did autographs, and ultimately, you know, we learned from experience that this just is not a good event for autographs. So no autographs, no pictures, and uh, the last thing before we move on is I do want to address that again, if you are a game or a field volunteer, you know, you will be checking into the volunteer tent, but uh, you will then head to your area. So if you're a registration volunteer, you're going to be heading to the, re the student registration area, and that will be sort of as you enter. Sarah Van Kirk will be heading that up. And if you are a games volunteer, you're going to be headed toward the enclosed tennis courts. There's no nets anymore, so just look for the inflatables, and uh, Hannah Ori Hell is going to be heading up that area, and you know they'll be able to train you at their at those respective areas of the event. So the last page is just an inclement weather plan. So again, we will do this event rain or shine. So again, if it is raining outside, sadly there may be less kids, but we will still roll outside. Now again, if this becomes a safety issue, 
If there's lightning reported in the area, we will have to move inside. But again, you know, the plan is to be outside. So please pray for nice, sunny weather on Tuesday, June 7th. So uh, that can be a prayer that we all have between now and then. But our inclement weather plan, again, rain or shine, is that if it were to be weather that would force us inside, the food and community groups, they will move indoors in the case of thunder and lightning. And uh, we'll probably have community groups in the hallway outside of the gym. And we will bring all of the kids into the gym. And it's not going to be as interactive, but we'll have stealers that will again get up. They'll do the program in the gym. The kids will be in the bleachers or on the floor. And then they'll model each of the drills, maybe call up some volunteers, maybe call up a few lucky kids to help them demonstrate those drills. But it will be much more of a program. They'll sort of lose the on-field aspect. But again, we will still be able to do a clinic if it is requires that we're indoors. But again, pray for nice weather so that we can be outside. All right, so just some final uh, housekeeping. Again, if you are viewing this right now on video, for those who were not privileged enough to be able to be here this evening, please, uh, what you're gonna do is you're gonna click continue on the video, and then you will be prompted with a series of questions. Uh, please answer those questions, it's multiple choice, and then once you press submit, Urban Impact, we will receive those answers. Uh, you likely will get a phone call or an email if you do not get a perfect score. It's definitely questions that you should be able to get a 100% even if you were not a 100% student during your academic career. I think all of us can uh, get 100 on this quiz. And then after that, you know, I will email you with some final instructions. So again, thank you so much for uh, coming out, for uh, getting trained, and for being willing to serve at this year's Urban Impact Clinic. And please continue to just be in prayer for the evening and that it would just be a great evening where we cultivate within the Northside community so that more and more kids and families could be impacted and transformed by Jesus Christ. So thank you again.